what we'll do, David, um, uh, if you don't mind, is we're going to start to take uh, Q&A. And there have been a lot of questions about sort of your, your most favorite and most popular thoughts or thoughts that you use quite frequently or find extremely useful. Um, I see that you go to 1983 quite a bit, but are there any other thoughts that uh, personally uh, you're gravitating to? I see that you do have some pins at the top of your brain as well. You know, I, I go all over. Right now I'm still more in collection mode than I am in reviewing this mode, though uh, you know, it, it very much depends on, uh, on what I'm doing at the, po at the moment. I, I don't I would say any time that I have time, it's one of the more fun things to do when your brain is kind of toast and you just want, but you still want to be creative and somewhat productive. You know, I found it's very useful to just pull up the brain. And as you know, and we, 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 just, we tested this before, it's hard to do, it's kind of do the random, uh, you know, the, the random shots here. And the, all of these things start showing up randomly connected and the connections just come up one at a time in somewhat random order. And it's a fabulous way to just do serendipitous brainstorming. Go, oh, that, I hadn't thought about that for a long time. Oh, my gosh, what a, you know, what a deal. So uh, you know, those, it also becomes a really good thinking tool for me. Well, I'll sit down and I'll start to think about that. You know, for instance, uh, you just mentioned clients, and, and what I saw you just did, I have organized them directly under here by all of these, but there are a lot of other you know, I just put them all into the different aspects of it, but I realized, wait a minute, I could go, I could go to, uh, you know, financial services, and I could start to reorganize those. In other words, we could do some called default, <laughs> defunct <laughs> financial service clients. You know, I could create another another group of those. So, you know, automatically, it just automatically creates some very creative kinds of brainstorming. So I can't say there's any one particular thought that, or thing that I do. I just have it always accessible to me, and I keep inputting it on it. And every once in a while, I need to go in and, or want to go in and see, hey, wait a minute, what does that remind me of? And it's very, very useful stuff shows up. And, J and uh, David, uh, Jay Cassio has a question about uh, what your 20,000 to 40,000 foot view looks like. So um, if you can take us there, great. If not, uh, we'll respect that. But um, uh, that was a particular horizon of focus that uh, caught some attention with the attendees. Yeah, well, 20,000 feet, you know, basically, uh, you know, has – there are lots of things that, 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 that can be involved with that. I actually have a connection to uh, – Mind manager. I haven't looked at this for a while in terms of the connections here. I may have created a new map, so I don't know if this one's still current. If not, I could just add what, whatever my new map is to it. But it's launching Mind Manager, which is where I have a 20,000 foot list there because I had created that before I actually even had the brain. So I just connected it to that file. Uh, basically, you know, 20,000 feet just says, look, here's all the different kinds of things that I have and I do and, and that, I, that I might want to use as a checklist in my life, if you will. So. Sorry. And in terms of your uh, views, there was another question about the horizon of focus and how linear or non-linear they have to be. Is there a certain area, a certain horizon that most people tend to stay on, or would you weave between different horizons of focus throughout your day? Well, they're all about areas that you have commitments in. So they become just very good checklists to look at and say, look, have I grabbed everything that, needs to, that I need to grab there in terms of am I moving on this appropriately? So, you know, if you don't have goals, you don't need to set, you know, I don't, I don't have any kind of shoulds there that you should look at any of these at any particular time. It's just that if you want to run a marathon and you can't run around the block, you might want to have a goal, so you might want to think, well, 30,000 feet. A year from now, what would I like to be able to do? So it's only all I did in terms of the horizons was just look at what are the different levels that people do have commitments. And not that you have to look at any one of them at any time. The good news is if you want to have a really, really, really clear head, you need to make sure at some point you look through all the areas of responsibility in your life, any goals that you have, any kind of vision that you have about what you'd like to have true in terms of some ideal and wild success pictures that you might want to be running. And, you know, if you've got a good sense of what your core values are and what you're about, all of that kind of thinking. I don't know anybody on the planet that can hold all those thoughts all at the same time. So all these externalization tools just give you great little stakes in the ground to go, wait a minute, do I have attention on that right now? Now, a lot of people have attention, for instance, you know, as I say, a good example of a 20,000-foot issue would be your pants keep getting tighter and tighter and it keeps bothering you more and more, and you haven't decided yet whether the, the answer to that is tailor or trainer, you know, or just lower your standards. You know, <laughs> so most people don't think about those kind of things, but if you really wanted to get clear, these kind of tools can really help you rethink those or put them up in front of you and make you more conscious about it. 
So it's kind of daunting because all of these things, there's not really a sequence to any of these. Though if I were coaching you and you wanted to get clear and you wanted to say, look, David, I really want to do the whole game, I'd go, great. Well, let's start at the runway or let's start at one of the most basic things, what's on your desk, what's on your mind, what's in your voicemail, what's in your email. Let's start with those. Let's clarify the actions and any projects. Those are the most easy to start to identify. And then we'll go up to 20,000 feet and say, okay, let's take a look at what are all the other things you're responsible for. What, are you, what is your, bob, your boss holding you accountable to do well in your job by the end of this year? Oh, yeah, staff development. Oh, yeah, asset management. Ah, oh, yeah. So as you move up in these horizons, it gets more subtle as checklist or as, as triggers to sort of remind yourself of these open loops you've got inside. Because most people, if I ask them, hey, you know, what's really on your mind, very few people are going to say, oh, I'm, I need to fulfill my destiny as a human spirit on the planet. <laughs> most people are going to go, I need cat food and my babysitter just quit. So the truth is, you know, kind of whatever has your attention, you need to handle that one. And then once you do that, it opens the, peels the onion back to let you look at the next level. And then once you finish that, it peels that back. So I don't know if that's a long non-answer to your question. I guess that basically there is no sequence other than pay attention to what has your attention and use these great little tools to help you kind of dig into them and hold a focus for yourself to make the decisions you need to make about them. Right, and I think the interesting thing about that, David, is um, because GTD gives you that methodology for taking care of these distractions, it really does enable you to then focus on what is important to you so you can have a larger view on your life or prioritize and, and add value. So it's, it's quite liberating in that respect. Exactly, and frankly, I don't know anything as good as the brain to give me quickly a sense of that kind of associational view and gestalt of my whole world. I mean, you can see it right here, the world of DA, right? Influential people, my lifestyle, miscellaneous network, places I go, productivity, resources, topics, you know, 50,000 feet concept. I don't know if you can still see my screen, but, you know, come on. That there's not, there's not a whole lot else that doesn't fit down underneath all of that, and there's nothing I found, no better tool to be able to give me that kind of gestalt and let, allow me to placehold stuff and not lose a thought. Because in a very strange way, if you have a thought that some part of you says that's a potentially valuable or interesting thing, whether it's a restaurant you just ate at or a, a, a factoid you just read in The Economist about Zurich uh, or whatever, and some part of you says that might be relevant at some point, but I don't know where to put that. The brain is exactly what you need. Interesting, and, and thanks for clarifying, because I think we had a lot of questions, David, on the Q&A about sort of what aspect or, you know, how, how fully are you using uh, personal brain for GTD or where does your personal brain uh, come in. And before you answer that question, I, um, as a technology vendor myself, I want to add that one of the most interesting things I find about GTD is that it is technology independent. Um, I know people who are using uh, personal brain for every aspect of GTD. I know people who are practicing GTD with notepads and folders. Um, so David, maybe you could comment on sort of the universality of GTD and, and how technology or any sort of arsenal of, of, of tools fits into that. Well, it depends on what part of GTD you're talking about. And you're right, there is no particular best there are, there are a lot of best practices, but the best practice is very dependent on the person. It, you know, if you'd like to use a computer but you can't type, forget it. You know, go back to paper and pencil. You'd be much better <laughs> there if the keyboard's a block to you. Uh, but it depends on when I say GTD. You know, as I said, you and I have been talking about some more subtle aspects of GTD, which is how do I maintain the appropriate perspective and also capture appropriate data and have it accessible to me based upon what it means. So a very key GTD principle is, okay, once I decide what something means, being organized means that I park that in a place that matches its meaning. So, you know, meaning gets very, very subtle and very, very sophisticated. And that's why I say the brain is so cool. So a whole lot, ev everything I've got in there is, you know, GTD says, look, if I've got reference material, whether that's potential autobiography material, I need a place to capture that, and I need a way to organize it creatively, because you know, if I want to think creatively about anything or situation, which is another part of GTD, is using that thought process, having externalization tools and tools that help me and help trigger creative thinking is exactly part of it. So most people's idea of GTD is where do I keep a list of, of actions and where do I keep a list of projects and how do I map that to my PDA. I understand that because that is a basic core kind of competency just to be able to keep track of the runway and 10,000 foot kind of stuff. 
and I don't use the brain for that because I like to externalize my stuff in terms of the PDA and and also because uh, you know I use Lotus Notes and I have a lot of a, a lot of investment and a lot of other things inside of Lotus Notes and you know my tools are already set up inside of there. But that doesn't mean I'm not using for personal brain for GTD. It just means I'm using it for that particular the particular aspects that I've talked about here. And it really doesn't matter. What matters is that you mat that you that you take something and you say, what does that mean to me? And that, that you have some place to park that that matches its meaning to you. In other words, you could do exactly what the personal brain does in paper. I mean, theoretically, because you could take all these things and you could make a folder called Switzerland and you could put little notes in there for everything. And then in each note, you could say, see file about Bill Smith. And you could have a file on Bill Smith and you could have a little piece of paper in there that says, see files about sailing and golf and marketing. <laughs> so one could do that because you guys had to do this in terms of writing code for this stuff anyway. Right. You could build in those connectors even on a manual basis. But heck, who'd, who'd want to deal with that? This is a, this is a great shortcut. So technology can provide wonderful shortcuts, but you need to know what to do with it first. If you don't know how you want to use this, it, it'll just feel overwhelming to you, as any of the software will. And David, we have some questions about sort of when you first started Personal Brain and what was your initial impression and sort of where did you first begin? What, what thoughts did you first start mapping out and, and organizing when you first downloaded the application? Yeah, good question. I, and frankly, I don't can't remember. You know, <laughs> been a lot, a lot, a lot of a lot of paths I've been down with that. Uh, Jerry Mikowski was in a seminar of mine, my one of my first pilot ma making it all work seminars in San Jose. Jerry turned me onto it, and you know, Jerry, I think at the time, I think he put his brain is his brain back up on the web. I don't know. If it it is, is, yes. Anyway, and Jerry, I don't know how many how many how many thoughts does he have in his brain? Um, he's over the hundred thousand mark over 100, now. And I thought that is incredibly cool. I mean, what a great way to kind of sort of offload your brain. Now, uh, you know, I know uh, Steve Bell at, at Microsoft, they got, you know, major researcher of, about just capturing everything out of your head. I said, no, that's a little overwhelming. But uh, this would, this showed me, it's like, wait a minute, this has intelligence to it. It has, it maps the way the associational part of your brain. There is a part of your brain processor that is associational. And that's why this maps very much to that. There's another part of, of your brain processor that's sequential. Those are two very different things. And uh, it's really nice to have a tool that maps to the associational part. Also, my brain tends to tend toward the more associational side. You know, I'll start to think of something and then start to run down all kinds of rabbit trails that that reminds me about. So I saw something that mapped to the way I think uh, right away and said, well, that'd be kind of fun. And I really didn't know how I was going to use it. So it was just a long experimentation. Let me just start inputting stuff. So I started just, uh, you know, creating things and creating an ideas. And as you can, um, as you know, as you start to do this, you know, you'll get better ideas when you see other things and then think, okay, let me change that again. And the, the brain was great because it kind of allows you to change it without having to re, re, totally redo your whole structure and start again. So it allows you to undo and redo your links and create, as you just demonstrated, to create some other things. I can't remember exactly what I started with, but I think it was, you know, obviously my company and sort of my life. So I think this world of DA was probably one, my, my first brain, the one that you're actually looking at here. And I began to just start to jot these things down, and then these categories began to kind of emerge. It's, it, there's, a, there's a kind of a function, a form follows function. That is, I started to just sit down and just dump this stuff out, and then as, it, as, as you started to see the connections, then oftentimes you could move up to another level of abstraction on it, which is what the brain is just fabulous for. So a lot of it would just get started. So if, any of you, if you're asking those questions simply because you want, want to know how to get started, I just say get started. <laughs> just give yourself some luxury time, maybe half an hour or something like that to just play and just keep going and just, you know, don't – and keep it around. Keep it up and keep it alive and start looking for relevant data in your email and things coming to you and say, okay, well, let me park that somewhere. And, you know, start – you could use the brain as a way to have that – have your life kind of start triggering the inputs you might want to put in there. Yeah, I, I like to uh, advise people to, to get started on something that you're highly passionate and interested about. So even if you want to use personal brain to map out your business strategy, but you're really thinking about um, golf, start with golf and, and then go to your business strategy. And of course, there's there's no limit to what you can add. So um, that's, that's kind of a good place. And uh, we did have a couple more comments on seeing even more of your brain and, and clicking around further. So David, if there's any other areas areas and I see you're now linking to Japan and, and hobbies. So 
Um, this is all catnip for our personal brain users, kind of peering into your, your digital mind, David. Yeah, well, I love, you know, pottery from Japan is what got turned me on to Ikebana. So, you know, that's that, that was just, you know, you know, very cool, very cool stuff. Um, you know, if I go Ikebana or pottery, yeah, that Hagi was, you know, some of the some of the best. Uh, karatsu, you know, these are two major uh, karatsu, oops, two major pottery places in Japan. Uh, to get, oh, cool. anyway, <laughs> let's say this is this is my idea of a good time. It is sitting down and starting to keep keep going on, you know, on all of that. So, uh, I, I you could call pottery actually a hobby too, because now that I have started to hobbies. So I'll connect that up there. That's an example. Golfers go. I play go as well. Uh, oh yeah, Steve, Ronnie by now. There he is. Ron is a go player. Oh, Paul K is actually starting to play go. That reminds me too. I've already got Paul in there. Cool. Uh, Ron also speaks Japanese, by the way, which is really nice. I've got him connected to Japan anyhow. Fabulous. Already already had a go connection. All right. Well, so I can erase that one. So, again, very easy to integrate things. And somebody noticed as your one of your previous jobs, you were a karate instructor. And they were True. wondering if you still practice karate and if you could uh, talk a little bit about that. Not <laughs> just spiritually. Ah, okay. So, uh, yeah. Now, um, in terms of um, getting things done, and you know, one of your books, David, is titled "The Art of Stress-Free Productivity." Um, can you sum up for us, or what, in essence, is the art of stress-free productivity? Well, it's, it, <laughs> what is this? The essence of it is is being engaged with your world in such a way that you are fully present and available with what you're doing, and it's in alignment with who you are and what you're about. And has your GTD evolved over time? Are you practicing the same getting things done today as you practiced, um, you know, ten years ago, or um, yeah, well, what? I, I, you know, I think GTD was just a recognition of the, the, the universal truths as human beings about how our psyche works. Uh, somebody, I think, Frode Odegaard described it as, you know, I, I looked at human nature and built the productivity model out of it. So it was really, the fact is, anybody's got to keep track of more than one thing that they can't finish when they think of it can, can use these principles. I have never had anybody negate the principle or say it didn't work, that when you've got a commitment and you keep it in your head, it creates stress that's not required. Uh, and that, you know, th th these principles were just, I, they just work. You know, if you've got stuff that's going on, you're committed to to externalize it, to get more discreet about what exactly it means to you. Park the results in some trusted place that you trust that you'll review and see at the right time. Then you start to build a trusted, systematic way to keep track of the things you're committed to and attracted to in your life in such a way that your psyche gets freed up of remembering and reminding. Once it's freed up, then it's, then you have all that creative energy available to you to be able to focus on what you want the way you want without having it being disturbed, distracted, and full of static with all this low-level tasking everybody's giving it to remember and remind. It's not designed for that. So that's just the truth. I haven't found anybody that's, that's said any different. So that's all I did was just recognize that's what it is. And what GDD was, was, okay, here's what that looks like if you're actually going to go implement that principle. Interesting. And, uh, David, we have a lot of questions. One of them is from uh, Robert Wobson, who's noticed that they see that you have mind maps as, uh, attached to your thoughts. So there was some confusion. You know, isn't this the same ty kind of tool? Do you use both? Um, where do you use the personal brain versus uh, mind map files? There is a similarity. I use mind maps when I want to be able to see the whole map connection in, in, in a way that I can't really see it with the brain. At all at one time, and it just becomes a little bit easier to manipulate that way. What the mind manager and mind mapping cannot do is create all these freeform associations that then you could, but it would be almost impossible because it's, it's still a bit more linear and sequential than the personal brain is. 
the personal brain allows me for a lot more of the random ad hoc and serendipitous kind of connections that I want to be able to make with things. Uh, so they're they're different. They're, right, they're and different. I just want to add to that is um, we do have absolutely users who use both products. You can also import existing mind maps into personal brain or store them there. Um, and you know, as David said, I think uh, one of the advantages of the personal brain is moving beyond a two-dimensional mind map and having an unlimited space for for connectivity. Um, but um, you know, it, it's absolutely something that can can work with the personal brain as well. Yeah, um, for instance, for instance, you could, if you were doing a mind map on a project and you came up with marketing, and you said, well, what else do I know about marketing or marketers? You know, the, the mind map's not going to let you know that. Uh, it, it, your, the personal brain would. So that's, that's where the, I think the value and the difference is, is that you're going to be able to make connections that may, be, you know, that, that may produce some value that you would not be able to use the other one to connect you for. It doesn't mean that there's not anything wrong with the mind mapping process. I found that very useful and valuable to just sit down and take a single topic and get things out of my head in that way. But it would be nice if there were some combination of all of those. But I'd say if you had to pick one, personal brain would probably give you both to some degree. Um, but certainly the connecting part of it uh, for sure in, in spades. Okay, great. And uh, David, we're on the hour. Uh, we do have several more questions. Uh, do we have time for a few more, or can, should we wrap things up? Fine with me. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, well, we'll keep peering into your brain. And there was a question from Jim Biddle. Uh, how does GTD uh, and the brain work for people who are ADH, attention deficit? Are there tips or tricks that have been used to help the organizationally challenged? Uh, I don't know. I, I, it's not an area of my expertise, so I'm not going to pretend that, that I do know a whole lot about that. I've been around it. Our head of coaching, Meg Edwards, is has expertise in that area. She's been a coach and a counselor for ADD and ADHD folks for years. So a lot of people in that world have found the GTD model being very, very useful and functional for people because it's not overstructured, and it does give you a way to create placeholders without creating too much structure for that and also allows you to take advantage of the, uh, of the sort of randomnessity that you know, if, you're, if your attention, if you're easily distracted, the good news about that is you're easily inspired. <laughs> In other words, I'm easily, I sit here and then I, then I think about that and then I think about that. Oftentimes, I think a lot of what, what exacerbates that syndrome for everybody, whether or not you've been clinically diagnosed, everybody is going to tend to be distracted by things that they can't placehold. If you don't have a placeholder for it, you know, they, then they, they, there's a likely to keep popping back into your head. People often ask me, David, where do you keep notes in the shower and when you go out for a run or something? And I say, well, I don't have thoughts on the shower and on the run. They say, what? I say, well, I'm, that's a little bit of a joke. But the truth is, if you captured a thought the first time you had it and parked it in a place you trust, you'd be surprised how few thoughts you actually have. <laughs> Most people have the same thought over and over and over and over and over again. So I will suggest that anybody, no matter where you are on that spectrum of attention and, and distraction, that having a place to be able to park thoughts is a really, really valuable thing to do. It also allows you to externalize and objectify what those thoughts are and you know, kind of take some of that pressure off. Now, you know, it, it, it's an interesting topic because I think as you start to get into this, you can say, well, I could be into this in an infinite way. Yeah, me too. And just how many things can your mind think about? Uh, at some point, you'll realize, well, wait a minute, it, it doesn't serve me to keep thinking any further along those lines there are other or better things for me to be putting my focus on. So there's nothing wrong with having your attention go a lot of different places, a lot of different ways. The only thing, would, the only limitation would be, well, wait a minute, what then are you not putting your attention on that you need to? There's the real question. And then what are the tools that you need to be able to put those things in front of you and to be able to sort of put blinders and signs in the road? You know, what are, you know, you drive down the road, you want signs to let you know, turn left here, and you also want blinders. I don't want to look 360 degrees. I want to look right where I'm going. And that's exactly what GTD and all these models are about. They help you put placeholders out there to be able to hold your attention as you want it uh, and also to help you focus your attention where you want it to go and to grab the things that then have your attention so that they're parked appropriately so they don't keep bothering you. Now, that's a big, long non-answer to that question. But again, I'm not an expert in that field, so don't take that as expert clinical advice. 
Right, and I'm I'm not an expert in the field either, but I'll just say for somebody who is short on attention, I find the dynamic reconfiguration of the thoughts and the instant activate for me personally as I'm shifting my focus from phone call uh, to task helps me sort of orient and, and sort of breathe a bit and gain focus. So um, I don't have any scientific basis for uh, personal brain and attention deficit, but I will say that it, uh, it, is, it is helpful for giving you that immediate visual briefing on the task at hand and, and, and kind of letting you, you see more. And uh, I guess on that note, uh, David, James had a question about uh, documents. If you do, uh, part of GTD is putting documents in buckets. Do you have a, a place outside of personal brain uh, for your documents, or do you insert, insert them into personal brain? What kind of strategy oh, do you use for, for your I have, documents? I have a gazillion places. I've got documents all over the place. I mean, we, have, we, have, we use Lotus Notes, and we've got at least 50 active databases of Lotus Notes that are all full of documents. Uh, of various sorts just because that's the easiest way to do it and they're equally distributed across the company as soon as anybody puts one in there. So there's there's those I just use, you know, I have Microsoft Office and I just use the my documents, you know, hierarchy and I've got tons of documents in there. Uh, it is true you can use the brain to help uh, as an organizing uh, factor for it. I haven't found that a, a real necessity yet, but it, it, it would be if I had an extra you know, few hours a week, I'd probably sit down and be doing that. It's just using it as an organizing tool to be able to help you coordinate where all these documents are and, and what they may relate to. Uh, mine just moves so fast, and oftentimes all, the best I can do is just kind of wherever they are, I just want to make sure I'm reviewing them and purging them fairly regularly so that it doesn't get just too overwhelming. But uh, personal brain is a, would be a great tool for helping coordinate and, and organize those simply because it, it kind of gives you an overarching relational database on top of wherever you have stored documents you know, in your computer. And David, do you have, um, I see you, you certainly have, you have two brain buttons. So uh, Robert actually had a question about how many brains you have. Um, is there primarily just the one you use and then, or the other one, or you've got, yeah, you have I multiple use, brains? I, I or? use World of DA, so I don't have to think too much about it. I, you know, I'm, I'm not using uh, personal brain for a lot of tactical, you know, day-to-day -day stuff in terms of uh, projects like you showed and demonstrated, although I'm sure one could. Uh, so the World of DA, is that, that's, that's, that's there. You can see almost anything that shows up out there will fit within some a subset of my world. Uh, if it didn't, I'd create another sub subset that it fit within. So, you know, if I, you know, under concepts, you know, for instance, humor, uh, the organizing function, getting things done, engaging energy, you know, so I can, I can. There's almost anything can show up there that I can. I can then tie things to. One very nice feature, by the way, very practically, when I double click on this window, as Shelly, you mentioned before, this note section down here, I, probably a lot of mine have emails that are just cut and pasted in there. Because that's all I do is I'll read the email, I just cut and paste it in there. It's somebody, somebody who wrote me I didn't know, but they've just written a new book. You know, so you know, I'll go to author. Uh, okay, I'll make them an author and find out who who the authors that I know out there and. And you know, oftentimes I'll have, you know, just the the books that they've written, and underneath I, I may have their email from from Dave Logan, you know, etc. So it's just a fabulous way to be able to, you know, as you can see, uh, tie lots of great data in there together and just dump it in there. So that's why I'd say if you want to get started, just go through your email and clean it up, and you know, all those emails that you might want to store that might have relevant things in there, whether it's jokes or uh, people you know or a restaurant somebody recommends, start playing with the brain, see what happens. Yeah, and you can drag and drop um, Outlook messages as well as Gmail messages. And uh, there have been a fair number of, of technical questions. Um, I'm, we're trying to keep the questions focused today on um, sort of the bigger picture and, and taking advantage of, of David Allen. So I do want to point out for those of you um, that want to get into more of the nitty gritty on how to do things in personal brain um, to join us uh, this Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific for Personal Brain 101. I'll be hosting this week, and uh, we can go into you know how to drag and drop files, web pages, and, and create thought tags and thought types, and and all that kind of stuff. And um, uh, David, this has just been great. I think uh, if you want to just cruise around a few more uh, areas in your brain, and, and maybe we'll uh, want to be hey, sensitive to your time. All the doctors, you know. 
right? Yes, <laughs> that is great. I, I do that myself. I link to bluecross.net because, you know, it's always it's hard to find a, a good physician. How about, a, how about all the attorneys you know? <laughs> how about all the consultants? And there's not room in the brain for all of that. All right. <laughs> no limits, David. There's no, no limits. No, that's right. You could actually put all, you know, even all the consultants that you know, you know in there for sure. Resources, right? Landscapers. So do you use your personal brain? Um, is it sort of always accessible throughout the day, or how often are you sort of in and out of, of personal brain, David? It's, it's there all the time. I mean, I, I, it is one of my open uh, applications. I have Lotus Notes open. Uh, I have a personal brain open. And, you know, those are the, those are probably my two most ubiquitously available uh, programs. Uh, you know, Notes co covers a lot of stuff because, you know, there are a lot of things that, are, that go in and out of that. But those are, you know, pretty much, it's pretty much ubiquitously available. So it's it's one of those that I'll boot up. Sometimes I'll forget to boot it up until I have something to stick onto it. Okay, oh, gosh, now i got to stick it, now i got to boot it up. But it's really nice when it's there. And my laptop it really is my... That is my office, so it goes with me pretty much wherever I am. So it's always available. Okay, great. Well, um, David, I want to thank you for giving us sort of this, this intimate tour in, in your brain and letting us sort of peer into your, your digital brain and, and sharing your uh, thoughts and ideas. If, um, if our users have any questions on uh, how to get started with GTD or want a little bit more um, consulting on, on how to implement per, uh, GTD in their personal brain, where should, uh, where should they go? Well, uh, free and easy is gtdtimes.com. That's a sort of company uh, blog. Kelly Forrester, who's our head of interactive uh, learning and all of our interactive stuff, Kelly's manages that and editor edits that so that's a great place if you have contributions you know for in and around it and also free and easy so that's an easy one at gtdtimes.com uh david at or davidco.com d a v i d c o dot c o m is uh just our basic website lots of ways you can surf around there free articles and other kinds of things and again gtd iq.com is a place you can take that free 20 question assessment and you might find that rather interesting to see where you are on the control and perspective scale. Uh, those are all ways to play. Okay, great. Well, David, thank you so much um, for your ideas today. And um, I think we are going to, uh, to close uh, the web meeting for today. And uh, we look forward to uh, adding um, our horizons of focus and, and just, just maybe new physicians in our brain. This has been a very productive session. Um, are there any other final thoughts you'd like to uh, end the meeting on today? Well, it's just on my. Uh, it's been on my. Uh, well, move for my someday maybe list to move it on the active list to be able to get down to the marina and hang out with you guys and do it. Just spend a, spend a couple hours geeking around and having great fun with sharing some some ideas about all of that. So I'm looking forward to it. So you guys are fun to work with, and uh, I invite everybody. It is truly worth the price of admission, almost for any one thing that we may have mentioned that could be useful to you for a unique product. All right. Well, thanks so much, David. And thank you, um, all, everyone who has attended today and uh, has questions. Uh, this seminar will be uh, recorded and available um, next week on the Brain.com recordings. And we are going to uh, close, close it out today. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us and uh, wish you well in uh, getting things done. Thanks, everyone.